Welcome to Radio Who, What, Why. I'm Jeff Sheckman. Back at the invention of writing, Socrates worried that it would destroy memory and undermine the oral tradition. The pushback to the printing press worried many. For those old enough to remember, the fear of television was once pervasive. It was the boob tube, the vast wasteland. And of course, we fragmented over other great changes, including the Great Migration and the move from a rural agrarian culture to an urban industrial revolution. All of these changes came with great promise and predicted as well as unintended consequences. Why should we think then that the internet, that the digital revolution, would be any different? As someone once said, history may not exactly repeat itself, but it certainly rhymes. My guest, Andrew Keene, has, with an objective eye, been following this history since the dawn of the information age. He wrote about the democratization of information in his book, The Cult of the Amateur. And in other books, he warned us how social media, rather than bringing us together, would fragment us and feed into narcissism. Now, in his new book, How to Fix the Future, he pulls together all of the consequences of technology. He shows us what Joan Didion once said of Southern California, that the dream was teaching the dreamers how to live. It is my pleasure to welcome Andrew Keene to talk about his new book, How to Fix the Future. Andrew, thanks so much for joining us on Radio Who, What, Why. Thank you, Jeff. That was such an amazing introduction. I think you probably wrote my book for me. (laughs) Well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. One of the key points that you make, and, and really what I was trying to get at, is this sense that in so many ways we've been here before, that what we don't bring to this and, and what you certainly do and how to fix the future is a sense of historical understanding. Talk about that first. Yeah, I think, and maybe this is a criticism of our schools or our culture, is that we forget that much of history is, as you say, it may not exactly repeat itself, but it chimes, it rhymes. And uh, the digital revolution in many ways, um, is a kind of repeat or another chapter in the uh, disruptive industrial revolution of the 19th century in the way it's undermining our jobs, changing the way we work, uh, creating more and more inequality between the very rich and the very poor, and many other things. So that's one of the things I, I point out in this book, is that to figure out our digital future We need to understand not only our industrial past, but how we've coped with other profound changes throughout history. The great issue in my book, I argue, or the great issue for us today, is human agency, is shaping technology before it shapes us. There's also kind of a catch-22 in that as we try to shape it, as we try to understand it, the landscape is changing around us. The technology continues to change so that we're, we're dealing with it. It's almost like building the parachute on the way down. Yeah, I mean, but that's true always, is that history is not a straight road. Um, it's not a line of code. It's not an algorithm. It's not a, a machine. Um, history is made up of many different stories of us human beings. I quote, Immanuel Kant, the Prussian philosopher, 18th century Prussian philosopher at the beginning of the book, who spoke about humanity being crooked. We are, by definition, crooked, and history is also, therefore, crooked. So what I'm trying to figure out is the crookedness of history. I think we like it, particularly in America, to be simpler, more straightforward, uh, more, if you like, algorithmic, and that's a fundamental error. And as we examine the changes that are going on, a couple of the bigger problems that you identify, and and you've mentioned a couple, one is the economic inequality that has grown as a result of this digital framework. The, the questions about the role of government to some of these companies get bigger and bigger, and also what it means for jobs going forward. Jobs is enormous. Jobs is, 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 is perhaps the greatest issue facing, if not humanity, certainly advanced societies today. We have invented smart machines that replicate us in many ways. These smart machines are going to get smarter, more powerful. Um, it's, it's a great invention, perhaps human beings' greatest invention. Some people argue it's our last invention because once these machines acquire consciousness of their own, we'll become their slaves. That's another book, another issue. I'm not sure that's quite true at the moment. But certainly these machines are smart enough to drive cars, to serve hamburgers, to figure out when we're sick, to 
to read law books, maybe even to teach, perhaps even to write books and do radio interviews. <laughs> so the great question is, in this world of increasingly smart machines, what are, what are we going to do? What, what are you and I going to do uh, that, uh, uh, that allows us to actually work and, and have a wage and support our family and feed and clothe ourselves? And this is a fundamental issue. In some ways, it's the same issue we went through in the Industrial Revolution. You know, everyone worked on the land, everyone grew food, then we invented technology, which meant that machines could do most of that. So what did we all do? We ended up in factories, which was pretty brutal. But then there were lots of reforms, lots of changes, and industrial work became better, more sanitized. And the, may, the same may be true of the digital ages. It's going to take a long time to work this thing out. There is no algorithm to fix the future. There is no app that can say okay, all this stuff's fixed. It's long, complicated, and dirty. And some of it goes to the heart of, of what we are. As you talk about, there's really a fundamental question of what it means to be human. Absolutely. And as I argue in the book, there is no universal explanation for this. Every generation thinks of what it means to be human differently. I argue in the book that given that we've invented these smart machines, these thinking machines that replicate much of what we do, being human these days means defining ourselves in contrast to these smart machines. Being human means having agency. Being, mu being human means having empathy, being creative, and doing stuff that computers can't do. Computers can program. They have a huge amount of information. They can crunch numbers and information. They can learn the law books and the medicine books. They can drive cars and they can flip hamburgers. But they may struggle to have this kind of spontaneous conversation. Computers don't know how to look after old people. They don't know how to love. They don't know how to have sympathy. So these may be some of the things that we need to concentrate on in our digital age. And one of the places that we need to be looking at that is in the area of education. And you look at some education models with an eye towards how that might be a window into this. Yeah, I argue in the book that we've always had five tools for fixing the future, five broad tools, um, regulation, innovation, consumer activism, civic engagement, and education. Education is, of course, the biggest. It's also the most amorphous. We, we tend, our culture tends to dump everything on teachers. And when we can't figure out how to fix something, we say, well, the teachers should be fixing that. And that's a problem. We need to invest, and I'm certainly not the first or the last person to, to argue this, we need to invest a lot more resources and time and thought into our schools. But I do look at the education system and suggest that some of the more innovative, innovative school systems, the Montessori or the Waldorf school systems, are the ones that are working now. Um, it's no coincidence that the Waldorf school system, which discourages, even bans the use of screens in preschool and in early, in, in, in first grade, um, these are very fashionable in Silicon Valley. The, you know, the, the titans of Silicon Valley are not encouraging their kids to use iPads or iPhones. In fact, Steve Jobs wouldn't allow them to have them in the house. Uh, I also look at um, some interesting educational experiments in Singapore, merging the humanities and engineering. What we need to do is bring the humanities back into the sciences, bring the two together. So I have a, a long education chapter where I spend time not only in some schools in California, but universities in um, in Singapore and other schools around the world. It's a fundamentally important issue for us to resolve. The interesting question is that this is a global problem in so many respects, but as we look at the way it's being addressed and dealt with throughout the globe, there are really different approaches taking shape, and, and, and the hope, I suppose, is that we'll begin to find or to see glimmers of some best practices along the way. Yeah, I think that's a very fair point, Jeff. And I went into this book understanding that Silicon Valley, of course, is revolutionizing the world with its disruptive technology, amazing technology, but also in some ways problematic. Um, but not all the solutions, not all the fixes to this new world are coming out of Silicon Valley. In fact, in, in some ways, very few are coming out of Silicon Valley. So I did a year's worth of research. I traveled around the world to write this book. I went to Estonia, I went to Singapore, I went to Germany, I went to India. I talked to over a hundred 
venture capitalists and activists and entrepreneurs and regulators. And I think that the solution to the future, the way to fix the future is now something that's taking place on the the global canvas. It's w w Americans and, and particularly people in Silicon Valley tend to be a little bit parochial. They tend to not be very good at looking outside. They just assume they're the center of the world. And in business and technological terms, they are. But when it comes to regulation, for example, the Europeans are leading. When it comes to civic activism, um, there's all sorts of things going on around the world. But when it comes to uh, governments employing strategies to figure out new social contracts on data and privacy, then the leading countries are Singapore and Estonia. So this is a, an, an aggressively global book. Every chapter features examples from my travels. There's no theory here in terms of fixing the future. It's all practice. I didn't just sit in a room and say, oh, now we need blockchain or now we need this app or that app. I went out in the world and I talked to real people who were coming up with real fixes to all these issues. And in looking at that global view, one of the things that becomes abundantly clear, I think, is that America is no longer the leader, that, that we're kind of stuck in terms of how to address all of this. Yeah, I think we have to be a little careful. You know, Americans tend to either enjoy thinking America is the greatest country in the world or the worst country in the world. And I don't think either of those are true. Um, certainly in terms of this, there is interesting stuff going on in America. I have a chapter where I talk about some of the innovation going on in Oakland, California, around the uh, sort of progressive venture capital firm uh, run by a woman called Frida Kapoor Klein, and who are doing really interesting work. Um, I quote a very prominent venture capitalist in New York, John Borthwick, who runs Betaworks, who's trying to innovate here as well. So there is a lot of stuff. We're already seeing it, and I didn't include it so much in the book. But now we're getting a kind of resistance movement in Silicon Valley to what's going on. So whether it's Roger McNamee, original investor in Facebook, or a guy called Tristan Harris, who right. used to work for Google, who now become one of Google's greatest, biggest critics, stuff is going on in America. But it's not just in America. So you're absolutely right. Um, the internet has become global. And I, I think whereas somebody like Mark Zuckerberg likes to imagine the internet as one global community because it benefits him, actually the splintering of the internet, what some people call the splinternet, in my view, isn't necessarily a bad thing. There's a European tradition. There's a Singapore tradition, an Estonian tradition, and they're all different in the same way as all these cultures are different. That doesn't mean that I celebrate some of the darker corners of digital society. I'm very critical in the book of what's happening in Russia mm -hmm. and Putin's attempt to kind of use the Internet to undermine our cultural and political institutions. I'm also very critical of what's happening in China. I admire much of the economic innovation in China. But China is now um, experimenting with a kind of uh, a digital totalitarian system where its citizens will be watched and valued in everything they do. That's certainly nothing to be celebrated. But in overall terms, uh, the Internet reflects us as human beings. We're diverse. We're crooked. So it should be, too. Globalism is often, unfortunately, particularly in Silicon Valley, been a smokescreen for world domination by a Facebook or a Google or an Amazon or an Apple. Which brings us to, to another part of the problem that you identify, and I want to talk a little bit about the nexus between all the things we've been discussing and the business models, what you call kind of surveillance capitalism that has really been at the core of Silicon Valley. Yeah, I think this is a huge problem. Uh, I, I, I use the example of the car industry. In the 50s, some of your listeners will remember, the American car industry dominated the world. They, there was barely a German car industry or a Japanese car industry, and American cars dominated not just the roads here, but everywhere. Um, now, of course, we know that's no longer the case. W what, what happened in, in, in American car manufacturers increasingly designed products that looked great, that were very sexy, but were essentially death traps. Um, Ralph Nader famously exposed this in his 1965 book, Unsafe at Any Speed. 
they were designing products that weren't friendly to consumers, that ultimately consumers didn't want. So American, uh, not only American consumers, but con consumers around the world turned against American cars and enabled the rise and dominance today of the German and the Japanese automotive industry. I fear the same with the Silicon Valley business model, which is giving these amazing products like Google or Facebook for free. And they are amazing. We all love them. We all use them all the time. But essentially turning us into the product because these the reason these companies are so uh, wealthy, they're two of the five most powerful and, well, and most highly valued companies in the world, is they essentially collect our data and sell our data, maybe not individually, or as, it's not all well, but it's, it's, it's also very disturbing. Uh, they, they, they essentially, by knowing us better and better, they're able to pinpoint advertising. And both these companies are advertising companies. Google's, for example, I think 96, 97 percent of its revenue is still from advertising. So ultimately, that business model is what people call surveillance capitalism. It doesn't work in the long term because eventually consumers are going to wake up and turn against it in the same way as consumers woke up and turn again, turned against the American car industry. In the long run, I don't believe that the business model at the heart of Silicon Valley, which, as I said, is a kind of surveillance capitalism works. That doesn't mean all Silicon Valley companies pursue this business model. Apple, for example, doesn't. Right. Apple is not really a big data company. Apple sells its products. Um, we buy iPhones. We buy uh, iMacs. Uh, Amazon also has a different business model. But I think the business model is driving many Silicon Valley companies from Twitter to Facebook to Google is in the long run unsustainable. And what's interesting is that those companies have been sold to us always with this kind of highfalutin dream that it's going to bring the world together, that it's going to democratize information. It's always with some grand sounding idea that, that helps create, they hope, help create buy-in. Yeah, and I think to be fair to Larry Page at Google or Jer or, or, or Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook, I, I think they genuinely believe it. I don't think these people are lying consciously, uh, although I think their marketing departments <laughs> have used this language to confuse and distract us. Um, but the original sort of myth, if you like, or certainly the dream of the Internet was democratization, bringing everyone together, enabling free information. And look what we have today. We have more and more discord. We have the more closing of newspapers, the undermining of information. We have Donald Trump taking over Twitter and creating a world of such confusion that more and more people are unable to distinguish between truth and fantasy. Um, so I think they're profoundly wrong. And I think, as I've argued for many years now, since 2007, when I wrote Cult of the Amateur, we need to pay for our information, for our content, and for our online products in the same way as we pay for our food or our rent or our cars or our transportation. Um, the problem is, is that we have been conveniently deceived, and most of us are not uncomfortable with that. Most of us think that we as consumers somehow deserve free products. And of course we don't. And in that sense, we're the mugs. We've got to grow up ourselves. We can't just blame Facebook or Google. We've got to acknowledge, for example, that if we want an amazing search engine like Google, we'd be much better off just paying for it, pay $10, $15 a month and then be guaranteed our privacy rather than having this thing for free and have a company like Google mining our data more and more intimately. And in many ways, it seems like that's contributed to the lack of, of respect for facts and information because it's a little bit of you get what you pay for. It's only by paying for something that you begin to respect that information. Yeah, and Mark Zuckerberg, for example, I talk about this in the book, right. He's unwilling to acknowledge that Facebook is a media company, which, of course, it is. It, they, we publish stuff on Facebook, and Facebook, as a platform, distributes that information around the world. Now, there's more and more controversy about this because we know that Putin's trolls, for example, have been taking advantage 
of this self-publishing platform to spread lies and disinformation. What Zuckerberg needs to do, and he's tiptoeing towards this, to be fair to him, is he needs to acknowledge that like a newspaper or a radio station or a publishing house, we need editors, we need curators, we need people to check that the people who are claiming to write something and put something on audio or video, that they're actually who they say they are. The same is true of YouTube. You know, YouTube, it's, being, it's, it's increasingly clear, has become an enormously powerful channel for disinformation, for people spreading lies, particularly from Moscow, but elsewhere. And, and these lies tend to be often not only divisive, but very unpleasant, racist lies, sexist lies, anti-American lies, uh, anti-European lies, for that matter, anti-democracy lies. And uh, we need editors, we need human beings, not machines, to figure out whether something can or can't be published and whether the person actually claiming to be publishing it is who they say they are. That seems to be obvious. And I think that ultimately Facebook has to acknowledge it's a media company and take responsibility, be accountable. The way to fix the future is for these companies to grow up and be accountable. They're beginning to recognize this it's still going to take some work, books by, like, like the one I've just written, these kinds of conversations. But I think they're beginning to understand their responsibility. Are there other grown-ups in the room, given the, the, the sort of naive sometimes and youthful nature of Silicon Valley? Where do we look for the grown-ups? I think there are more and more grown-ups, actually, in the room. Uh, there are even grown-ups, you may be surprised to hear this, in Silicon Valley, there are billionaire grown-ups even. I think um, uh, Reid Hoffman, the co-founder of LinkedIn, is someone I respect. I've known him a long time. I think he's trying to do good. Um, I think, uh, as I said, Frida Kapoor Klein over in Oakland and the venture firm she's founded with people like Ben Jealous, who's now running for governor of Maryland, her husband, Mitch Kapoor, who was the founder of Lotus Notes. And there are more and more of the, the cheerlead, the ex-cheerleaders who are becoming grown-ups. Roger McNamee, for example, very prominent Silicon Valley venture capitalist, was an early investor in Facebook, made a fortune through it, but now has turned against it. He's been writing more and more op-eds telling Facebook that it has to be count, become accountable, that, that the technology that, 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 that the company is designed or the product's designed around it being addictive and they have to be responsible for how people use it and why they use it. Uh, Mark Benioff, the CEO of Salesforce.com, a multi-billionaire, I think is a grown-up. He made mm -hmm. a speech at Davos recently telling companies like Facebook and Google that they need to grow up. So I think that the zeitgeist has changed. That's one of the reasons I wrote this book. I've been arguing for 10 years that something's gone wrong in Silicon Valley. At first, I was part of a very small minority of people. I was accused of being an elitist, out of touch, not getting stuff. I think that was very unfair because I'm a, a Silicon Valley entrepreneur and I'm anything but a Luddite. But now everyone's beginning to say the same thing that I've been arguing for 10 years. So now the challenge is not pointing out the problems, but getting down to the fixes, figuring out how to fix the future, which is why I've written this book. So rather than concentrating on the problems, we need to come up with the fixes. And I think we need to reward and acclaim people like Roger McNamee, who are coming out now and saying, look, I was wrong. I may have made a fortune, uh, but now I'm going to try and make the world a better place. It's going to be interesting to see how this plays out in terms of whether people respond or push back as more and more of Silicon Valley becomes a kind of punching bag, as there's more attacks on Silicon Valley in both the cultural and political realm right now. I fear that. I, you know, Silicon Valley is... It, the problem is that it's very easy in America in particular to go from being this sort of ideal place of innovation and wealth and happiness to being the worst place. The same happened, I think, to Wall Street. Uh, Wall Street is an important generator of wealth in the U.S. It certainly has many problems, but it's not something you'd want to shut down. And the same is true of Silicon Valley. So I think it's particularly important for the grown-ups in, uh, in Silicon Valley, the Roger McNamees, the Mark Benioffs, the Reid Hoffmans, to begin to take responsibility. Um, 
this is also particularly true. I think we, we need more women leaders. One of the problems with Silicon Valley is it's become one of the worst kind of boys clubs. Um, that's why more we need more prominent women. Uh, Frida Kapoor Klein is one example of women who now are arguing that the way for Silicon Valley to grow up is not only to take responsibility, but to change their kind of HR architecture so that women and minorities have power. At the moment, it's a white boys club producing products for white boys. That's one of the reasons why Uber went so wrong. One of the other aspects of this is remembering, I suppose, that we're really still just at the infancy of all of this, that there's so much going on now in terms of AI, in terms of robotics, self-driving cars. I mean, there's a lot more to come. Oh, my God. You've got the old baseball metaphor. What inning are we in? It always comes up in Silicon Valley interviews. I, I, I have a show and I often ask people. And it's very rare for anyone to suggest we're anything beyond the third or the fourth inning here. Um, smart machines are going to change everything. AI is going to change everything. Virtual reality, augmented reality. Increasingly, human beings are going to become indistinguishable from computers. We'll ingest computers. We may augment our brains and our physical parts. So we're still at an early stage. I just did an interview with um, a prominent uh, German executive. He's the CEO of Burda Media, the th third largest media group in Germany. And I said to him, where are we? And I tried to develop the baseball metaphor. He said, look, I don't know baseball, but I do know soccer, which in Germany, of course, is called football. And he said, we're in the 60th minute. And as I'm sure you know, uh, a soccer football game lasts 90 minutes. But the Germans in particular, who are masters at strategy, always know that things only really happen after the 60th minute. So in other words, what he's saying is wherever we are, whether it's the 50th minute or the 60th minute, the third or the fourth inning, the really important stuff is yet to come. The game is yet to be determined. Nothing has been decided. Well, it's, it's you know, the Mark Zuckerberg line about moving fast and breaking things. We're, we're kind of at the point where we have to start to fix things. Absolutely. Well, that's why we're in the 60th minute. Uh, we need to break things. Uh, we need to uh, fix things. But at the same time, we have to keep moving. And Moore's law, Gordon Moore's law, it still drives us forward. That's why in the book I introduce another kind of Moore's law, Thomas More, who wrote Utopia, who spoke about the, uh, the 16th century English writer of Utopia, who wrote about the centrality of human agency in determining our fate socially. So we need two kinds of Moore's law in the world. The Moore's law that is disrupting and changing everything, Gordon Moore's law, the law which means that computer chips double their power every 18 months, which is driving everything forward. But a more human law is Moore's law, which uh, is the title of my first chapter in the book, that focuses on what it means to be human in the development of agency, of creating a world which we shape rather than that world shaping us. Andrew Keene, his new book is How to Fix the Future. Andrew, I thank you so much for spending time with us. As always, Jeff, that was a fabulous interview. Really appreciate it, and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you. And thank you for listening and for joining us here on Radio Who, What, Why. I hope you join us next week for another Radio Who, What, Why podcast. I'm Jeff Sheckman. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share and help others find it by rating and reviewing it on iTunes. You can also support this podcast and all the work we do by going to whowhatwhy.org forward slash donate.